Hi, I'm Andy Dancer, Mere CTO for Trend Micro. Here to talk to you today about 2011, the year that shook the world. We chose the title partly because we hoped it would, it would fill the room. I guess it worked. Partly because actually it really was. It was a year when there were several things that happened that really changed the dynamic of the threat landscape and hence the way everybody has to react and protect it. This is my simplified radar diagram of what's going on. Everybody today is being asked to grow their services, typically with less resources. Often it's now the do more with less, the classic example. They're still working on their virtualization and considering cloud. But hitting them from the left-hand side there is some of the advanced persistent threat challenges. And I'll come back and describe those a bit more in a second. And of course, consumerization. From 6 o'clock, consumerization is catching up and sometimes overtaking virtualization and cloud on the radar of the IT guy today. Let me focus for a little while on the advanced persistent threats and what they mean, what the implications are. There are four clear stages. The first one is entry. This is, I need to get inside your organization, inside the corporate perimeter. I want just one machine in order to do that. I don't need to compromise the entire estate, just one machine. The second piece is with that one machine, I'm then going to move on and compromise the stuff I need other vital servers within the organization, places where the really expensive, valuable data resides that typically aren't connected directly to the internet, I'm using that first machine as a bridgehead to get there. The third phase is discovery. It's about once the stuff's compromised inside, how long does it take me to actually find out that's happened? And the fourth stage, which is compromise, is how long once I've discovered something is going on does it take me to do something about it, to completely clean up, to sort out my network? The entry game phase, this is a, a game we thought we'd won. And we thought we'd won it by perimeter security. It was about build big walls, firewalls, IPS, IDS and so on. Big high walls, keep everything outside, treat the internal network as safe. But actually the rules changed, the games changed. You can't do that anymore. The mass attacks that we're all used to, just pounding the perimeter with every known vulnerability to try and find a chink somewhere in our armor, it's still going on. But what's different with these advanced threats is they're unique and focused and targeted just on your organization. They've often chosen one individual within the organization. And they said, right, you, sir, what we're going to do is we're going to go after you. We're going to research you. We're going to find out everything we can about you. We're going to find out what your hobbies are. What you, what you do on an evening, and we're going to send you something that's targeted very specifically at you to make you click that link. Because once we've done that, we've sent you to the wrong place, we've infected your machine, and that becomes the bridgehead to go on to the rest of the organization. And my hypothesis today is actually, if I'm prepared to spend enough money, then I can get any organization I like. I just need one machine inside that organization. And let me show you some examples and walk you through, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll all agree. So, apologies for the participation here, but everyone's put their hands up in the air. Then I do it this way because everybody has to participate. As I go through now a series of threats, put your hands down when the threat would have got you, and just be honest. So, the first one, random and common. The typical Nigerian 409 scam, I've got a load of money, and I need to move it from here to here, and I just need your help, and I'll give you 20% if you'll just help me out with use of your bank account. I need your bank account details and so on to do it. Okay, most of the hands are still up. We'd expect that. The next piece, it's your bank. And your bank are writing to say that they've had a bit of a problem and they just need you to verify the security details to make sure that you're really still you and that it's okay. Again, we're all used to those. We, we've tuned out from those. How about this though? How about an app for your mobile phone? And the app looks like it does something really nice and innocent, but actually, when it's installed quietly in the background, it goes and does some really nasty stuff. Do we really know, or do we just go, ha, ah, that's a four-star rating, I'll download that one? Got a few more hands with that one. Let's try this one, because this gets most people. How about if you came back to your car, and there was a parking ticket on your car? And on that ticket were two URLs. One to go to and say, hey, this wasn't me. I shouldn't have had a parking ticket for this. The second one, to actually go and pay. Would you go to one or other of those URLs? Probably the one to protest and say, hey, I had a legal parking ticket. Well, this one happened in the US, and from what I understand, it got most people. And looking around the room, I think most of you are honestly saying it probably would have got me too. 
We'd go there, it had a nice official logo, documents enclosed, envelope on the window, all the stuff. For the couple of hands I've got left, try this one. So, Dennis, I send you a LinkedIn invitation after this, and it says, hi, it's Andy here, and uh, I saw you were watching my presentation, and I just wanted to connect to you on, on LinkedIn. I thought it was a great question, and, and really like to follow up with you on that. Would you click the link then? Probably you would. See that hand's twitching? Well, I think what we're saying is as soon as you join the real world, it drops our barriers. But imagine that was at an exhibition and we'd had a chat and the person standing just there read my name badge and yours and constructed that link from, from LinkedIn to look very, very genuine, but actually took you to a bad place. So that's the entry phase complete. Hypothesis proven. If I don't get one person in the organization, I move on, try some similar tricks with somebody else, one of them will fall. It's probably a senior person. They have a public profile. They're easier to find out information about to, to, to run the social engineering tricks. Education is essential to reduce the volume. A few years ago, more hands would have gone down on that first phase. But the fact that the hands stayed up is a credit to the education and how it works. But it doesn't work for everything, and there's still a window. There's still a point when we've joined this enough to the real world to get you, and that's where the damage is done. Let me move on and change gears for a second. Let's talk about Android threats, mobile threats. Little graph here showing the growth in Android malware over the last few months. And you can see we've left the, uh, the scale off the axis here because there's not a great deal out there right now, but the growth curve is quite impressive. If I move on to the next slide, You'll see the projections here that by the end of 2012, we could be up to 100,000 different bits of malware. And quickly you get to a point where you don't want to be carrying a pattern file around on your Android device that's matching against 100,000 potential different bits of malware. We need, just in the way we did with the PC, to move to a new system that uses a cloud-based reputation and you can look stuff up in real time and stay up to date. Change gears again. Talk about Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a real game changer. There were several things here which were a little bit unique and different. This is a piece of genetically engineered malware. It's targeted against a very specific geographical region and does a very specific job within that, all about trying to destroy the Iranian nuclear program by making the centrifuges spin out of control and break. It jumped systems. It started on the PC and then jumped to the industrial control systems. It contained multiple zero-day attacks. Very unusual. Mostly people don't waste multiple attacks in one piece of malware. Why would you if you can get people with one? Why give more away than you need to? This was very unusual in what it did, and it changed the game. Here's another example, similar one. And this is a water pump, a water pump which was controlled remotely over the internet. And the pump was switched on and off very, very rapidly to the point where it burnt itself out and broke. And the point was made that actually there were other pumps in that same facility that controlled the dosing of chemicals, how much chemicals got put into the drinking water. And somebody could just as easily have changed that and polluted the drinking water. So we're seeing for the first time the effect of cyber control on real physical world stuff. So back to our APTs. We've done the first phase. We have entry. Compromise says, let's start by assuming I own a PC, probably a senior person. The data's valuable, but that's just the start. What I want to do now is go on and get more valuable stuff from elsewhere within the organization. And to defend against that, we need a new security mantra. Out goes this feeling that there's so many attacks to stop, we just block at the network edge and treat the internal network as safe. Don't stop blocking at the network edge, that's great because everything you can keep out reduces noise, reduces the amount of stuff you have to watch for on the internal network, but don't treat the network as safe. Work on the principle, actually quite the opposite, that it's not safe, that machines have already been compromised, and figure out how to defend against that. So keep out what you can to reduce noise. That's a good thing. Don't trust internal machines. Assume that the server next to yours is already compromised, it's trying to attack you and figure out how to defend. Clean internal infection sources. This is a vital one. 
out there in the big wide world of the internet, all you can do is block stuff. At your perimeter, you're just stopping stuff coming in. You can't go and do anything about it. Internally, if your machines aren't published to the outside world, and you can therefore say, ah, we blocked that, but it was being attacked from another machine on my internal network, you can go after that other machine, you can clean it up, and you can stop it trying another exploit, which perhaps you won't block. And protect my data. Work on the principle that at some point somebody's going to get something, they're going to get to one of your machines. And protect the data so that if you lose the battle, you don't lose the war. So it's data still encrypted, somebody's stolen it, but they can't actually use it. If we come back to those four stages, what we find is the first one, entry phase, happens very quickly. And I think we've proved today that it's very difficult to completely eradicate. You can minimize it, good thing, reduce noise, but you can't block it. The second phase, compromise. Once they're in, it's pretty difficult to stop them, but there is stuff that you can do, and I'll come back to that in a moment. If you get that right, you can discover it earlier. And by discovering it earlier, you can collapse what sometimes takes weeks, months, even examples where years before somebody's realized that stuff's going on inside their network. And likewise, you can contain the stuff. Plan as well for what you're going to do if this happens before it happens. Have a plan so that if somebody breaks into your network and steals your customer data, you know what you're going to say to the media and when, when you're going to notify your customers. Don't wait for it to happen and then run around trying to decide what to do while the media crawls all over it and your names are in the headline every day. Get out there very early on, manage the situation, this is what's happened, this is what we're doing, take control. Protecting the data is vital. We've all got used to a system that we call outside-in security, traditional security. Block everything outside my network, stop it getting inside. We're recommending you also do the opposite, which is inside out. And that's to start at the data and encrypt it, watch what's happening on the network, data leakage protection, and track everything as it moves and leaves your network to see what's happening. It has to be time critical. The, the software that you're using has to understand the what, who, where, when, what's going on. Because today's secret R&D material is tomorrow's marketing material. The information changes over time, or the value of that information and how you need to contain it changes all the while. What else can you do? What does it look like? Well, here on the network diagram, we have a range of attacks trying to hit the perimeter on the outside. And we're blocking most of them, but something's managed to get through. We also have a couple of compromised endpoints and some more where our protection's intact and it's doing a great job. Those endpoints, the good stuff, the traffic that should be there, and the bad stuff that shouldn't is all flowing around my network. And I'm going to use some specialized threat detection to watch that network really carefully, to spot everything that's happening and analyze it as close to real time as I can. Then over here, I'm going to protect my valuable servers. And I'm going to take an inner perimeter around each of those servers to protect that server. So if something internally tries to attack it, it's defending just in the way that the edge of your organization usually would. Let me explain that in a little more detail. This inner perimeter is built up from a series of services, deep packet inspection, firewall, antivirus, log inspection, integrity monitoring. In a virtualized environment, it can do all this in what we call an agentless fashion. A single security virtual machine protecting via the hypervisor for all of the guests that sit on there. That can be incredibly efficient. You can increase the density of machines that you put on the hypervisor to get a better return on investment while increasing the protection that you deliver. This software is becoming mature now. We're at version 8. And this piece in particular, the deep packet inspection, allows you to do something we call virtual patching. In the UK this year, we have the Olympics. And we have the Olympic change freeze. Many organizations, we've spoken to several today, are looking at blocking patching on their systems as they freeze them over a period of several months while the Olympics happening. And yet, that's probably the period when those systems may well come under more attack than they've ever seen before. When somebody's looking to get, in their world, that scoop of managing to take down some infrastructure during the Olympics and the publicity that might generate. This provides the ability to virtually patch systems and keep the protection current and up to date without needing to modify the operating system. So you know the servers are going to keep running, but they're protected. The next piece on there over here, 
specialized threat detection and the analysis and track back. This is a product we have called Deep Discovery. This is about saying, OK, let's watch really, really carefully what's happening on the network. Let's weed out, firstly, anything that we know is OK and anything that we know is bad. And that gives us a gray area in the middle. By hooking this up to our cloud-based reputation system, we can get lots of the bad stuff definitively. We know it's there. Straight away, we can block. But the stuff that we don't know about, we can analyze, we can simulate it, we can put it in a sandbox, allow it to run, watch what it does, and say, ah, this was bad. This machine tried to attack this machine here. This is what it did. You can go and clean that up and do something about it. Vitally, rather than yet another management console, you can take an integration with your existing SIM system. You can pull the information in, put it all in one place, and have some new screens which really break that information down and get it into a usable format so that you can take that and get actionable intelligence rather than just noise. Finally, I wanted to come back to, to the mobile side and talk very briefly about mobile app reputation. This is the ability to look at an app and to watch what it does, to say, is this sending premium text messages that it shouldn't? Is it crawling all over and reading your text messages when it's got no right to be there? Is it harvesting contacts from your address book? Is it actually just written really badly and it's draining your battery life and, and is not a great app, not one that you want to install? And the ability to do this so that the app stores can take this and they can know that the stuff that they're putting into the stores is safe and the users that download them are going to get good apps and that enhances the reputation of the app store and so on. This is primarily targeted on the Android marketplace today because there were multiple app stores, which makes it a bit of a wild west, less controlled. Although I'm sure in time we'll see this extend, this sort of technology, across other platforms. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll open it over for questions. <laughs> <laughs>